I would like to introduce David Brin, who's, despite that trip, still alive. Um, David Brin's been a science fiction author for a very long time. Um, as a result of having uh, a fair amount of insights over the years, written books like Earth, um, and ha has ended up working as a scientist uh, with groups like NASA and JPL over the years, um, doing very ordinary kind of scientific work, um, as well as doing the kind of science fiction work that people like me appreciate. Um, he's uh, been recently been working on a book called Existence, uh, which seems to bear some resemblance of other book series that he's written, but that book's not out yet, it'll be coming out in June. So probably you're looking forward to as much as I am. He sent us an excerpt for us to read, which I have a suspicion a fair number of people have looked at. Um, and uh, thank you very much for coming. Sure thing. <laughs> now, what it doesn't mention is that we, we've known each other a long time. Back when I, um, I lived in England, back in the mid-1980s, I lived in London for a couple of years. Very interesting times, the Thatcher years. <laughs> and um, later on, when I finished Earth, my then fiance got her doctorate at Caltech. We packed up our belongings and we had to be at her postdoc in Paris in six weeks, so we took the long way around the world. If you ever go to India, don't get a round trip without first looking into a round the world pass. I don't know if they're still done the same, but you can take an entire year to finish it zigzagging around the world. And we arrived back in LA a year to the day after we left in order to get married. She still says, you never gave me a honeymoon. <laughs> well, because most of the trips after that were with kids. I said, I took you to Easter Island. I took you to Australia. I took you around the world. And she says, that was before we were married. <laughs> The day after we were married, we went on a plane to the mo number one honeymoon spot in the world. And she said, that was going home to our apartment in Paris. <laughs> Hard woman, but worth it. OK, so I'm going to uh, do just a lot of song and dance just about ideas. Because here, I feel very much at home. I feel very much at home at Google. And besides which, I was born not 20 miles from here. So went to LA High, same high school as Ray Bradbury. As a matter of fact, the one time my kids ever gave me unalloyed respect for two hours stretch, all three of them at the same time, was when I took them to meet Ray at his house. And he got up from his walker, David. <sighs> Ah, two hours. Solid respect. Amazing. <laughs> OK, so in any event, hometown crowd. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to leap and hop and jump around. So what I'm best known for is the science fiction novels. Um, uh, Postman was, was Kevin Costnerized. Uh, don't, don't ask me about that. <laughs> Earth uh, is credited with having web pages two years before the web was invented. Big deal. For a lot of us, it seemed obvious where the world was going. Um, Transparent Society is one of the only public policy books from the 20th century that's still in print and still selling more every year, partly because of some very, very creepy um, prescient predictions that came true, and partly because it's one of the only places that is standing up for surveillance as a solution to our modern uh, information problems. Rather than trying to use, as the Europeans want, use law to protect people's privacy. As a short-term solution, I don't object to such things. Over the long term, it's not going to work. Um, the most recent book, which is coming out uh, with the cover on the left in the States and on the really creepy, ominous cover on the right. It's going to be in 3D, by the way. They're going to use a new experimental process in Britain for the um, cover of existence there. Uh, and both of them will have this, I'm uh, going to tell you guys for the first time, I just found out about it, big, nice, glowing cover blurb from Temple Grandin. How about that? Uh, have you ever heard of her? She's the most well, yeah, the, uh, the Claire Danes movie, yeah. 
um, most famous autistic person in the world. Uh, okay, so, but I'm going to get to talking about something entirely different. And now for something completely different. Um, I'm going to talk about the big picture. Now here's a big picture aspect, one, just one of many, and that is the fact that for the last 500 years, Western civilization has been having breakthrough after breakthrough having to do with three things. And that is our ability to see, our ability to know, and our ability to allocate our attention. And the first of these crises was precipitated by lenses, which empowered the ability to see, the printing press, which expanded your, uh, the public's access to knowledge, and perspective. This is a little more complicated than this, because about the same time the discovery of, of the Americas and the, and, and the vastness of the world also had major uh, effects upon people. Now each time, I'm going to race through this, each time what happened was you had uh, augmentations of memory, vision, and attention. And one might also argue reach, because your ability to do physical things expanded as well. But these are the three I'm paying attention to. And the result was not always an expansion of people's wonderfulness, kindness, or even empathy. Empathy did come from, eventually, from augmentations of memory, vision, and attention, but not at first. At first, these things were used for polemic. And the printed books that were produced after Gutenberg's um, era for uh, 150 years tended to exacerbate social problems, to exacerbate hatreds. Um, and each time a quandary was developed, you know, the, re the Renaissance versus rigid doctrine, and new concepts spread, the notion of progress, the notion of the value of the individual. Now, I'm not going to go into these in detail. But down here at the bottom, the knowledge mesh is expanding our ability to have access to memory in profound ways. It's almost as if you remember that, so this or that or the other. Omnivalence. You know, television was one of the major, radio and then television, these were major forces that drove our ability to empathize with people far away. Radio, the broadcasts of, um, Edward R. Murrow from the London Blitz helped to convince Americans to get involved in World War II. Um, uh, coverage from Vietnam helped to convince Americans that, that this was not an undertaking that seemed very worthwhile. Um, visualization, simulation, and gaming, these are all areas in which we are running into the crisis that Linda Stone talks about when she says, to, speaks of continuously divided attention. And as a, a parent of a kid in high school who wants to do his homework while Facebook is up and while listening to music on the headphones, I have to explain, no, this may not be the best approach. And yet his generation insists that it is. Uh, the, but you see, my attitude is always the attitude of the grouchy earlier generation. And that is that the uh, people are not going to be able to adapt. With each new tech wave, godlike expansions of vision, knowledge, attention, and reach led to fear of hubris, trying to take on God's power, or self-destruction. Future shock. I think it, it, your neighbor Alvin Toffler here in town uh, deserves to be one of, considered one of the great visionaries of the 20th century because it's very clear that for the first decade of the 21st century, America has been in a horrible shape, state of future shock. At least a third of our citizens don't want to have anything to do with the new era and the new sense, uh, century, uh, which leads to calls for renunciation and control by a trusted elite. This is something I go into in existence. And yet, despite painful adjustment, we never refuse these new prosthetics. Always these godlike powers become the new norm. Now, who would have imagined that we would be able to, with this ape-like, or Garden of Eden-like, this ape-like organ in here, to be able to adapt to these floods of information, vision, attention? Well, part of the answer is 
that, as Carl Sagan pointed out, we share the medulla and the cerebellum with fish. The mammalian cortex is laid upon it. The primate cortex is laid upon that. The portions that we share with apes are laid upon that. But then you go, go farther, and what you get is something that is just above the eyes, little nubs above the eyes. Who can name them? The prefrontal lobes. The prefrontal lobes are the organs that we now know are the organs of the future. They are the seat of what Einstein called the Gedanken experiment, or thought experiment. You know that uh, relativity was 50% him imagining riding a streetcar at the speed of light, leaving the burn cl uh, clock tower, and figuring out where all the rays would go and where they would arrive. Only 50% only of it was math, and he left half of that to his wife. The point is that the Gedanken experiment is what you do when you think with these prefrontal lobes. What would happen if I raise this at the meeting today? What would happen if I wear this? What would happen if I try to run this yellow light? And as you guys, you males know, um, we have to make those decisions about these Gedanken experiments all the time. We're constantly saying, nah, 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 nah. Now, we know about this because um, prefrontal lobotomies, they have snipped and people lose the interest in doing these thought experiments about what they're going to do. They remain intelligent people. But that's why I would much rather have a free bottle in front of me than a prefrontal lobotomy. All right, all right, I saw the head shake starting there. The point is, that this layering effect is arguably what we are doing with these prosthetics. We are simply adding external layerings onto this layered set of cortexes that has already been taking place. And that is one theory to explain why we have so gracefully adapted to orders of magnitude increases in our ability to know remember to see and pay attention. Now, I'm going to veer aside a little bit and get even more general here. Most human civilizations were shaped like this. A few lords at the top lording it over vast numbers of peasants below. And what was in the interests of those rulers? These were the allocators. And it made some sense for a while because we had very, very little surplus, frequent starvation. If you're going to have any kid live his whole life with ever have, out ever having an episode in which his brain was starving, it might as well be the kids of the priests and the, and the, and the, and, and the lords. <laughs> you had to have somebody. And so feudalism made some sense. And Locke's social contract was, just rule us well, or we have the right to cut off your head and replace you with somebody else who seems likely to rule us well. That's the implicit social contract of Locke. Now, we are supposedly moving toward what Heinlein prescribed as the explicit social contract, where every 19-year-old will negotiate with the state and sign a contract. And if not uninterested in living by this contract, go someplace else and sign a, a looser contract. Heinlein laid that out. And it was a, it's a very, very interesting potential endpoint for this process from the implicit to the explicit social contract. And we're not going to go there at all today. The, the point is that this was all an attractor state propelled by Darwin and human nature. Once you're a lord up there, it is in your own Darwinian self-interest to persuade hundreds and thousands of virile young males to go off and fight and die to protect your seraglio for you. And the awesome thing is we're all descended from guys who pulled that shit off. <laughs> They actually succeeded at that. We're descended from the harems of guys like that. Wow. So this is a major, major attractor state. And I defy you to take Dungeons and Dragons dice, go home, roll up random decades across the last 6,000 years, and random locations. Any place that had metallurgy and agriculture, big males teamed up, picked up metal instruments, and take, took other men's women and wheat. Find, for me, the exceptions. Even the Soviet Union was, was run by a nomenclatura that acted exactly like the czarist ruling class. 
The alternative is called the Western Enlightenment. And it is very, very different in a number of ways, including its shape, the first human civilization in which the well-off outnumber the poor. And therefore, the poor is a small enough portion of the population that we feel guilty about it, that we feel something can be done. Instead of a bitter sea that could never be drained, it's a bitter lake, and therefore somebody's fault. In every way, it's different. The churn effect, the notion that no one should inherit automatically the, the status of their parents, and the fact that we believe in the positive sum game, that the rising tide will lift all boats. Now, one can argue that we are in a position right now that our parents faced, and their parents faced, and their parents faced, because this is inherently unstable. If it's an attractive state, attractor state, it is a metastable attractor state. And every single generation, some of those who got rich by these methods do their best to try to make it into a pyramid, because it's in our genes. I don't think the Koch brothers are inherently evil for obeying what their genes tell them to do. We just have to stop them. <laughs> Our parents did. Their parents did. The Enlightenment's over 200 years old, I'll have you know. Do you know what the first acts, political acts, done by our founding fathers as soon as the Treaty of Ghent was signed and, we, and the United States was officially independent? Two things. A seizure and distribution of over one-third of the land in the colonies, and an utter ban of primogeniture. You could not, for 100 years, leave all of your um, belongings to a single child. It was fiercely, it's not fiercely enforced today, but it was fiercely enforced then, because they had the large families divided up equally, your oligarchy problem goes away. Most people don't realize how radical our founders were about this notion. Now, here's another big concept for you. You have hierarchical institutions. We've had them since Sumeria, since the pharaohs. And these are inherently pyramidal. You have a commander in chief. You have uh, pyramidal shaped structures that are supposed to do various things, enhancing their communications among these um, various portions of our government is something I've been consulted on. You guys are engaged in that as well. Here you have a different type of institution. Here you have the four accountability arenas. Now the accountability arenas are the driving engine behind the Enlightenment. They harness creative competition. The greatest force for, for creativity in the history of, in nature, we are, all, we are all the result of creative competition. Darwinism made us. And creative competition isn't necessarily sweet. It isn't necessarily fair. Usually, in the last 6,000 years, when it took place in marketplace, you wound up with lords who then tried to cheat to prevent further competition from happening, but instead to have their own kids own other people's kids. The brilliance of democracy markets, science, and law courts, is that they are designed to harness competitiveness through ritualized combat. In each case, there is a highly ritualized, regulated form of combat that minimizes the blood and waste on the floor, but maximizes rewards to those who actually deliver a better product and service. Now, in some cases, like markets, it's inefficient and not always accurate. But we can afford that in order to have it be f more freewheeling. But supposedly, you aren't supposed to be able to wind up at the end of a round of competition with a monopoly that would then stop all further competition. Instead, once you've created a new product or service, it's supposed to ge engender more. And if this is not what's happening, then something's wrong with the regulations of the system. Same is true with democracy. Democracy can be filthy. You can get wrong results. Boy, can you. But the point is that supposedly you wind up, look, 2012 is the year that Robert Heinlein forecast in his future history, back in the 60s and 50s, 
that America would be taken over by a fellow by the name of Nehemiah Scudder. Ever heard of him? Oh, you really need to know more sci-fi. Ne <laughs> Nehemiah Scudder does not even win a plurality, but a Supreme Court decision gets him the presidency anyway. I think we're mixing this with a different year. And then he de clamps down, shuts down the Constitution, and declares himself prophet of the Lord. And there's a 70-year theocracy in America. Very, very chilling. The point is that each of these has its own rituals, and that's why we usually don't think of them in parallel. But their similarities outweigh their differences. There's always a centrifugal phase in which, through safety, you can prepare your product, your company, your political party, attorney-client privilege, or your laboratory and your ten tenure in science. But then there is ritualized call to battle, the scientific conference, the publication, the marketplace, the court trial. And the degree of ritualization is determined by the need or not need for explicit accuracy. In courts, everything is extremely meticulous because you can't afford a more than 1% error rate. But it keeps things slow. All right, didn't even need to get going on that. What I really care about is this one. You can see that these are entirely different processes. This is the old pyramidal structure of decision making, hierarchical decision making. We have needs for it, but it should devolve to here wherever possible. Here you have structured competition. Here you have the people, and this is where the web is starting to make a difference in the ability of the people to converse, in their ability to get involved in the problem solving process and perhaps lead to an age of amateurs. Now we spoke of the lamps on the brow, if you're ever in, um, Rome, be sure and visit the greatest piece of sculpture ever carved, Michelangelo's sculpture of Moses. It's a few, it's about 10 blocks away from the Vatican in a little side church. It's amazing. You swear he's about to stand up. And he's formidable. Makes you look like a little guy. Okay. So the main thing, the reason why I show this slide is I do a lot of consulting for the Defense Department, Defense Threat Reduction Agency, CIA. I'm, I'm, uh, after this trip, I go off to the Air Force. And I talk about the professional protector caste. The professional protector caste has had its budget increased tremendously since 9-11. And yet here's the interesting thing. On 9-11, they failed completely at what they aim to do. And that's use these prefrontal lobes to try to anticipate using data collection, total information awareness. As you've heard about the two new $2 billion facility NSA is building in Utah, to hear everything. Um, and then analyze it, and then proactively act on dangers. Fine, God bless them. As long as they are subject to scrutiny and surveillance. Surveillance, S-O-U-S, valence. That means looking from below. Surveillance means looking from above. Incredibly important term. I helped um, Steve Mann uh, coin it some years ago. Very important term. If we have surveillance and supervision on these professional protectors, then we'll have a choke chain to remind it, the watchdog, that it's a dog and not a wolf. I need to be less chaotic here and spontaneous because these things get recorded. It's just, it's just ah. But the other thing is to remember is that anticipation wasn't even involved on 9-11. Every single act performed by our professional protector cast on that day failed. There was not a single success by any level of professional protectors that day including the brave heroes in the uh, New York Fire Department. Um, remind me to get a link so you can see the, my abortive TV pro show that I was supposedly going to be one of the stars of called Architects without a T, um, in which we slept in New York's fire stations and interviewed the surviving heroes of Rescue One. And, and their comrades went charging into those buildings. Very brave, didn't work. What worked? I'll tell you what worked, as soon as I can get it. This worked. Average citizens out in the streets saying, I know the 911 operators are telling you to stay by your desk and help is on the way. Get out! 30,000 lives saved by that. 
It was New Yorkers who fought the fires when the professionals died. And it was people armed with this stuff that rebelled, who rebelled on flight UA-93. Ending the war that day because the war was a test of our manhood. It, is, it was essentially. Every decade, Americans are challenged by opponents who believe in the zero-sum game. The fundamental ethos of the, of the West and of the Western Enlightenment is the positive sum game. If you must read any book during the next year, read Robert Wright's Non-Zero. That explains the distinction between these two things. In a zero-sum game, if I win a point, you've lost a point. In a positive-sum game, I'm going to get rich making Google, and all my employees are going to get rich just a little less than me. And all the people out there are going to have plenty of opportunities to get richer because we've set everything up. We all benefit with, from the positive-sum game. Well, the point is there are many cultures in which people are not raised assuming positive-sum games. So they look at America and they say, you guys are rich, you're happy, sexy, you must have traded something for it. Hitler said so, the South said so, uh, the Soviets said so, so on and so on. Every generation makes this calculation and says, Americans, they have all this stuff, but they're decadent. They have no manhood. They have no courage. They have no guts. And the heroes on flight UA-93 disproved it that afternoon. They won the war. Through the other thing, you have anticipation, and then you have resilience. So this is Steve Mann. This is the uh, goggles arrangement that he had in 1980. And it got smaller, smaller, smaller. And now, of course, you guys are doing it. And this is a character from my new novel, where she has these little, little uh, cyber-activated doogies that come up and look around in all directions uh, out of her hair. And you can barely make out the stuff going on on the inside. And over lunch, we were talking about how the tooth clickers and the little subvocal checkers and all that sort of thing. And the main thing is that, uh, oh, have you heard about the latest DARPA challenge, uh, these annual things? Uh, a couple of years ago, it was to find the red balloons. And the, the um, last year, it was to uh, remake shredded documents. This year, it's the challenge. Um, and there's a team in San Diego you could join if you want to, is to track five teams of fake jewel thieves all across America and Europe and, and to catch images of them. So the notion is you get smart mobs. And if you had read that scene, those scenes that Alex told you about, we have some scenes from Earth and some scenes from my new novel, you'd see this in action. But this is from Patrick Par Farley's wonderful web comic called Spiders, where Basically, um, this little girl in America is the one who finds Osama. This was pre-Osama dying. Back when I was at Caltech as an undergraduate, we were worried about something called the overspecialization problem. It seems logical. It seemed to be completely where things were going. And that is the notion that the, um, every year, we know more and more and more. Right? Chemical abstracts used to be all paper. And when the chemical abstracts would come out every year, it would be bigger and bigger and bigger. And these are just abstracts of chemical papers. What does this mean? It means that every year, in order to be a specialist about something good enough to get a PhD, you have to know more and more about less and less. It seemed an unstoppable trend. And with the vocabulary getting narrower and narrower, you would not know if someone in the next building over there using a somewhat different vocabulary was studying the same thing you were. So you get duplication of effort. You get slowing down of uh, accomplishment. You're 60 years old before you know enough to get your PhD. It seemed terrifying. It seemed likely. It seemed unstoppable. There seemed to be no way out. And now it seems that no one ever mentions this anymore. It seems a bizarre, quaint thing 
to ponder. Now, the way I just described to you, it sounds logical. And we may hit that wall again. Why didn't we? Well, obviously, I was there at the beginnings of computer literature searches. And I could see, I could get links to things that were obscure in various directions. And the trick was, I had to do the Google tricks myself and come up with uh, uh, different vocabulary twists that would sometimes bring in things from other, uh, from other departments. But the other thing is that people got smarter. Down at UCSD, we just won the right to um, establish the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination. It's going to be wonderful. All the deans in all the departments, art sciences, they've all signed on. Cognitive science and neuroscience is going to study the process of imagination while getting involved, the artists and, and the authors, and uh, then, then determining new ways of, of uh, using computers to enhance the, the imaginative process in kids. It's going to be very exciting, and please keep track of it, OK? We'll have an announcement by the summer. But the point is that that is reflective of cross-discipline, a breaking down of guild boundaries, and the fact that you guys, there's a word that starts with G. It's become a verb and a noun. The point is that that is the principal way in which people have been able to get past the problem of narrow-minded over-specialization. And now Nicholas Carr and the cyber grouch grouches are talking instead about a problem of, of broad-minded, scatter-brained, shallow-mindedness. And that's the doom and gloom scenario that people are talking about. I'm sure you've all seen this cover of Atlantic. The notion that this is not necessarily making us smarter. It's making us more aware. But they aren't necessarily the same things. Wish I had time to go into that in more detail. Now, we won't go into huge detail about the big picture issue, but another important book from the last few years gets you nice and depressed about how likely it is that we're going to have a collapse of human civilization. The opposite extreme, the singularitarians, as a, as a contrarian who loves to be in the presence of people he can say yes but to, you know, libertarians who I can sound like a liberal, liberals I can tell about Adam Smith. This is the golden age for me. I was, I was garroted and burned at the stake in all of my other lives. I get to live to be in my 60s and see my kids and get, and get paid for this because, uh, yeah, but, yes, but, the people who think we're all going to be gods in 25 years <sighs> remind me of Porgy and Bess. It ain't necessarily so. OK, the, the one big perspective thing that pins it all <coughs> is the Fermi paradox. And that is the question of why we see no signs of anybody out there. They're the, the, the great big constructs that our, gen, our descendants may build. The visitations. The Earth was prime real estate for two billion years with no oxygen atmosphere and nobody above the level of slime molds to defend it. Why in all of these movies do they show up now? <laughs> The Drake equation, of course, uh, in, in one of my papers, I've been engaged in this for 35 years. And in one of my papers, uh, which is the only major review paper about the field, I expand the Drake equation because it doesn't predict anything in that sense. Um, but the whole notion, you're all familiar with the Drake equation, right? The notion of the fraction of planets the, that are out there, the number of planets, well, that, that's one part of the Drake equation that, uh, that has been expanded just in the last 10 years. It's amazing times to live in. And we'll live to see, you know, whether or not there's oxygen and methane on some of these uh, atmospheres and all that. But whether or not this pale blue dot, by the way, I consider this picture of the Earthrise from the Apollo 8, from that horrible year, 1968. It was like Pandora's box got all open. All the evils left out, and there was this one thing, little, little gleam of hope at the bottom of the box, the Christmas message from the moon showing the little oasis in space, one of the two most important works of art in the history of humanity, and it was done by scientists. The other one was, too. Who can name it? It changed us forever, changed our attitudes towards war. The image of the atom bomb. Both of the, because visual art 
is, is changing human hearts and minds without verbal persuasion. And the two most powerful symbols that changed human hearts were the image of the earth and the atom bomb. So the question is, you know, will there be life? You know, how could, will there be the development of intelligence, technological intelligence that survives a series of traps, a series of crises that might leave us like Mars? In fact, there's evidence that this is our second planet. We originally came from Mars because didn't, don't you want an extra hour every day? Wouldn't you be happier with half the gravity? Huh? Huh? We miss our homeland. Let's just hope we don't do to this planet what we did to, what we did to that one. The point is, I forget why I put that guy there. The point is, is there a great filter? Why are the numbers small in the cosmos? Smartphones got a chance of little communication working. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the honeypot. The honeypot is one of the more popular notions of well, what keeps the sil it, it empty, and that is we all, all the races go down into cyberspace. And I don't believe it because uh, if even one race has a bunch of grouches who like to ride motorcycles and are techies, then they'll become hell's angels and they'll be the ones who have the kids and go off into space. Everybody will be descended from them. Well, their distant cousins are back home living forever in the, in the, in the web. Um, this whole question of whether the great filter lies behind us, and it may very well be that we are very rare in our technological intelligence. Or it may be, catch me some other time, and I believe there's a good chance of this, that 99% of life worlds are water worlds, and that ours, with a lot of continental land area, ability to make hands and fire species may be relatively rare. You have the guys who think it's coming right away. Good old Ray. He's, he's very optimistic because he's one of the oldest of the singularitarians. <laughs> so he thinks it's going to come in time for him. And his younger colleagues are going, oh, Ray, sorry. It's, gonna, it's harder than you think. Yeah, it's going to be at least another 20 years after that. <laughs> but in time for me. <laughs> so anyway, these, this is, gives you the whole range of some of the possibilities. He's a character in my new novel. I, I couldn't resist. I couldn't resist. Everything that you've, you've seen in this slideshow is all in the new novel. I want to get into some practical stuff that is standing in the way of our ability to be a resilient civilization that practices the age of amateurs, not in order to get rid of the professional protectors, but in order to augment them because we're going to need healthy institutions, we're going to need healthy uh, accountability arenas, those arenas, the markets and courts and science and democracy, and we're going to need to have the enhanced resiliency that comes from a fully empowered um, uh, populace. In this argument that we saw, in that Google is making a stupid thing, you have the cyber grouches like Nicholas Carr, saying that uh, it, it's not helping. Clay Shirky and the cyber uh, optimists are all saying, look how many people are expressing themselves. All connected and expressing themselves. And the average length of the self-expression goes smaller and smaller and smaller and then had a major lobotomy down to 140 characters. <laughs> Another major lobotomy when Facebook made the return an automatic post. <laughs> I, could, I, I could outdo Facebook. Just, just, just $20 million. <sighs> the point is, he, he's, they're both right. Do you remember how I mentioned there was this pattern in the accountability arenas that have developed over the last 300 years? A pattern of centrifugal gathering in safety, creating product, but then a ritualized co call to combat that could not be refused and would result in maximizing the test of product while minimizing the cost that used to accrue to that, to competition. Death, blood on the floor, monopolization. That pattern exists 
well in those old systems. It's always under threat. Several of them are under profound threat right now in the West. But we'll deal with it. We're, we're no less people than our ancestors. Please, please, please. The point is that the internet is missing half of it. Think about it. It's got this. You've got people able to separate out into little Nuremberg rallies. They can argue, they can stew, they can perfect their product. But where is the ritualized combat that makes bad stuff go away? I'm not talking about creating an elite that says, that's a bad idea, no one will discuss it anymore. I'm talking about a kind of ritualized co a combat that made the Edsel go away. Most of you don't get that, so what? Uh, what's something more recent? <laughs> that really. <laughs> All right, MySpace. That makes inferior stuff go away. How many of you have been on a blog in a comment section and you wrote something that absolutely devastated an untrue statement? And a dozen other people said, right, death, dead. And the next day, you see it again somewhere else. Nothing dies. And death is how creative competition works. All right, let's just go through a few of these. Your phone. These fo this phone was the hero on 9-11. On Katrina, and again at Fukushima, you had hundreds of thousands of people with these in their pockets, fully charged, unable to do squat. Fukushima, they found several people had t made text messages and all of that. They were clutching their cell phones under rubble. They had had time hours. Nobody came. The cell, the cell towers were down. I, I, I go at this again and again and again at, at the, in the defense, at these defense meetings. It's insane. All it would take is a simple law demanding that Verizon and the others include a simple, crude, barren packet switching, text passing, peer-to-peer -peer system in the cell phones. You could even have it so that if you don't have a cell, you, it doesn't turn on unless you, if you are detecting a nearby cell tower. I think that's chicken shit. I mean, if you could not come up with a system that would tattletale on, along the way from cell phone to cell phone and tell who passed it on until it reached the, the cell tower, give them a penny each, and charge an extra nickel to the person who sent it, then you don't deserve to be an engineer at these companies. I mean, this should, you should be able to make money doing that. But there's no excuse not to have it. Think about it. You're buried under a building. You, you, can, you can send a text and then put it down, go to sleep, and at some point when someone's passing by, it takes the text away. With a few dozen repeaters across the Great Plains and the Rockies, we could we, we could have a crude telegraph system across the entire country if all the cell towers were down. But this should give the, the, the cell phone manufacturers a, a way to go into that dark mile. You can say, in most places, you'll be able, even in the dark mile, you'll still be able to send texts. Especially if people are encouraged to leave their, their phones at the edge, hooked in a, and logged in. Oh, I earned a buck last night. Passing on, uh, why? I talked to the vi a vice president of Verizon. All he could give me was just hate-filled glares. I couldn't even get why. Other examples, abysmal self-organizing software on the internet. No emergency modes of access. There are people working on that. There's all sorts of examples on the web where you can see where there are people who are working on possible Wi-Fi based systems, Bluetooth based systems. There are lots of other examples. I'm putting solar on my roof right now. Um, and I, I've been asking about this. Do you know, we have billions of people in America with rooftop solar. You know what happens in a power blackout? It shuts off. You cannot draw power from your own solar roof 
in a power blackout. There are some kludge, there are some workarounds that cost thousands and thousands of dollars. What would it take to come up with a box that people could add to their solar system that would power one plug inside their house with all sorts of warning labels on it? You know, flashing lights and all of that just for their fridge and their rechargers. <sighs> um, why are we still vulnerable to EMP? We've known about it for 40 years. I'm going to surprise you now, but say that Newt Gingrich was right about that. I mean, actually, he's the only one of the bunch who would invite me to the White House. Because <laughs> he's a sci-fi fan. He's a sci-fi author. I mentioned the other sci-fi fan, Temple Grandin. Ah. Dull, dull, dull cell phone designs. Ah, horrible, stupid. Oh, well, I'm going to take a. No. <laughs> I'm going to show you what a cell. I'm going to show you a cell phone design. I'll show you this. I'll talk meanwhile. My my son came up with this. And I was part of a workshop in which we talked about Snap-on phones in which you snap on peripherals that could do sensing, that could do detecting, that could put the laser di di uh, display or the, or the um, laser projected keyboard. All these things that you aren't normally using. Interface, web interface. You can see that, you know, let me tell you something. I am old. Back in 1973, I sat at a teletype. There was not a single computer monitor on the planet. I sat at a teletype at Caltech, and there was one of the first networks in the world. A computer, a couple other computers on campus, and I typed away at the teletype, and in black ink, DB, colon, and part of what I said. Interrupted, CK, colon, in red what someone else was saying. Then RL, and colon, what somebody else was saying, and then DB finishing what I had typed. Now here's the weird part. All of you know exactly what I'm talking about. It wasn't at all surprising. You understood exactly what I was saying. Why? Because sometime in the last few months, you did exactly that. Why did you whippersnappers have a clue what I was talking about? A alternating, interrupting, scrolling chat. Uh, I'm sorry, the example here is MySpace, but it's the same damn thing. Lobotomization, lobotomization, lobotomization. Have you ever been to Second Life? I've had some of the most populated events ever there. You know, I'm sitting there on stage, do, interviewing away, wonderful buxom uh, bods out there, and the actual con exchange of informational content is down here in the lower half, alternating, interrupting, scrolling chat. Now, in fact, conversation goes back to the Neolithic. I think our ancestors had cocktail parties. Seriously. I mean, you knew where, the, where you usually had a successful hunt. You would send boys up ahead to gather firewood and to crush berries into gourds and hang them way up high in the trees. You had the, this year's successful hunt. You drag the carcass over. You'd start the firewood, and you invite the Ugra tribe over. Pull down the gourds and chat. We're good at it. And you know how, in a conversation, you adjust who you're talking to by proximity, by angle of orientation, by your estimation of their reputation, <laughs> by the public estimation of their reputation, <laughs> by how interesting what they have to say is, whether it's topic related. But you've been in a restaurant, and you've, not, you've, you've seen when um, Somebody said, mentions your name two or three conversations away. What happens? It pops out of the buzz. And you know, here's the scary part. A sentence or two before your name came up. 
several words of lead-in. What does that mean? It means your brain is providing services to you, constantly sifting and controlling what enters into your conscious awareness. Now, all of these things that I've just described to you, aha, uh -huh, this is very funny. When are you going to stop wasting your time with that science fiction nonsense and start dealing with reality? He's doing a horse and cart, very funny. We give a high priority, but we are able to allocate our, dis our attention. Um, we adjust attention by criteria, topic, time, reputation, etc., etc. The point is that everything I just described to you is non-existent in interaction on the web, even though it's proved important and useful in allocating what we see, what we know, and how we pay attention in real life. These are real life phenomena that have not made it onto the web. And I can prove that to you. If you look at the old Google Tech Talk, in which I, uh, I'm sorry, I had a lot more caffeine that day. Uh, <laughs> and that's taking breaks with my co-deliverer, um, um, Sheldon Brown. He's going to be head of the um, Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination. But what I did during that talk is I looked at my watch and I said, I know because I was just granted a patent. And it happened to be on the day that my patent came through. Every one of those things I own. Now, does, does that surprise you? <laughs> does, does that make you skeptical? It, well, it should. I don't expect any of those things, any of those claims, to survive heavy duty attacks. Undoubtedly, there's some graduate student somewhere who adjusted screen allocation values by reputation. Another who did it by angle of orientation. We even found a couple at IBM that we had to modify the, the patents. What the patent means is that nobody's currently making a billion dollars off those, those things. Nobody at all. Let me see if I can remember where this goes. How does this work? Oh yeah, that's right. that's right. That goes there. And that goes there. It's been a while since I've done this. It's going to look a little awkward. Now, you're always answering the phone like this and emanating into the world. How about, there's your watch. There's your watch. It's on your watch band. Ring, ring. Ring, ring. Ah, shoot. Hello. <laughs> Microphone is here. This happens to bring earphone right up next to your ear. Well, yeah, it did. OK. Hello. Now you're covering your voice. You're covering your mouth. It, it'd at least sell in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> now, hey, take a look at this. Oh, wow, man. That's incredible. Hey. <laughs> it's just an example of where you got to think you know, the people say outside the box, you gotta, you gotta think outside the playground. Because groupthink is everywhere. Now, if you like, this is the exorarium. We'd love to set this up. It is a um, both computer game and museum, museum um, place where you would go from creation station to creation station and um, you ch first choose your solar star, and then your solar system, and then your planet, and then your ecosystem, and at the end of it, you get your own alien. And we, uh, we were invited up to talk to Will Wright about his thing, Spore, because um, he, he was way behind. He was a couple years behind on Spore, and he was scared of us. And we, we laughed, and we said, if we had four orders of magnitude better funding, you should be scared of us. <laughs> and so he described to us Spore where you buy attributes for your race. And we said, oh, oh, I see. You do creative design. 
we do evolution. <laughs> now, I thought he laughed, but Sheldon said, no, 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 he was, he, he was, he was angry. <laughs> but then you take your alien race down to the extraterrestrial terrarium, and you have, an, have encounter scenarios. And you can do this online, of course, as a computer game, too. Uh, you know, I would complain about the fraction of my ideas that ever see real life, except for the fact that I have a fair number of them that see real life, and so nobody's going to listen to me or give me ha hearts and flowers. It's frustrating. I don't even get any pity. So my objective was to not be your typical talk, uh, to not have a particular focus, but to dance around and poke at ideas that perhaps some of them you hadn't thought of before. Big perspective are us. Anybody? OK. In that case, um, uh, if you knew about Street View, Facebook, and other modern sharing stuff that we've got now, uh, at the time you'd written Transparent Society, you'd had many of the ideas back then, but things have turned out a little bit different in various ways. How would you have written the book differently? It's all gone pretty much inconsistent, pretty much consistent. I mean, there, I'd have more examples. I mean, the fact of the matter is that we are seeing a drift towards hierarchical institutions having more and more power to see. The defenders of liberty are rightfully concerned about that because the image that we have of Big Brother with the telescreen is pyramidal. And the main thing about the telescreen is not the existence of the telescreen in 1984. It is the fact that it is one way, thereby enforcing power in a pyramidal structure. If the telescreen operated two ways, and the people, even the proles, were, were uh, able to listen in at every secret party meeting, it would not matter that the party has absolute power of physical control. Nevertheless, within a generation, everything would change. It is not the equil equivalence of power that matters. It is some degree of equivalence of knowledge. There are all sorts of potential equalizers. For instance, you as an individual can join non-government organizations, ACLU, uh, Electronic Freedom, uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation, and all of these things. By pooling together proxy power, you are enabling them to hire professionals who are in range of the professionals run, run by the Koch brothers. Um, these, these, these techniques exist, these equal, equalization techniques exist. And we see this sort of thing happening all the time. And a recent example was WikiLeaks. Uh, I know the uh, digital, top digital guy of Hillary Clinton in the State Department. And he said, he confirmed to me, that if she could give a secret medal without anybody risking anybody ever knowing about it, she would give a medal and a great big wet kiss on the mouth to Julian Assange. Because he created what democracy and transparency is supposed to create for our public leaders, and that's inconvenience. He was highly irksome. But that was it. There were a couple of dozen embarrassing cables that he re released, and the storm over those went away. Meanwhile, there were thousands of cables released that showed our diplomats hating Hosni Mubarak and hating the dictators that they had to work with, and totally within the cables being consistent with our public state, uh, statements. The result was when the Arab Spring burst, and Assange says it was all because of him, when the Arab Spring burst, there was not one American flag burned. There was not one hint of anti-Americanism in the Arab Spring. And a large degree that is credited to the fact that this asshole went ahead and leaked a quarter of a million cables. And the only loser out of this were our enemies and that idiot who's going to go to prison for the rest of his life because he thought he was being an internet hero. And all he was blowing the whistle on was people doing their jobs. 
So, shall we hurry through questions? And those of you interested, we could show you that. But um, thank you very much. You've been a lovely audience, and go Google.